The Story of Civilization Volume 3 Caesar and Christ Part 1 by Will Durant Continued Cassette 11, Side 1 But Marshall's obscenity sits on him lightly. He shares it with his time and never doubts that even high-born maidens in palace bowers will like it. Lucretia blushed and laid down my volume, but Brutus was present. Brutus, go away. She will read it. The poetic license of the age allowed indecencies, provided the meter and diction were correct. Sometimes Marshall boasts of his lubricity. No page of mine is without wantonness. More often he is a bit ashamed of it, and begs us to believe that his life is cleaner than his verse. At last he tired of purveying compliments and insults as a source of food. He began to long for a quieter, wholesomer life and the haunts of his native Spain. He was now fifty-seven, with grey head and bushy beard, so swarthy that anyone, he tells us, could see at a glance that he had been born near the Tagus. He addressed a poetical bouquet to the younger Pliny and received in return a sum that paid his fare to Bilbilus. The little town welcomed him, forgiving his morals for his fame. He found simpler patrons there, but more open-handed than those at Rome. A kindly lady presented him with a modest villa, and there he spent his few remaining years. In 101, Pliny wrote, I have just heard of Marshall's death. The news has deeply grieved me. He was a man of wit, piquant and mordant, who mixed in his verse salt and honey, and not least of all candor. There must have been some secret virtue in the man if Pliny loved him. Chapter 15. Rome at Work, A.D. 14-96. to 96. 1. The Sowers. To the Silver Age belongs the classic Roman work on agriculture, the De Re Rustica, dated 65, of Junius Columella. Like Quintilian, Marshall, and the Senecas, he came from Spain. He farmed several estates in Italy and retired to a residence in Rome. The best lands he found were taken up by the villas and grounds of the rich, the next best by olive orchards and vineyards. Only inferior soils were left for tillage. We have abandoned the husbanding of our soil to our lowest slaves, and they treat it like barbarians. The freemen of Italy, he thought, were degenerating in cities when they should have been hardening themselves by working the earth. We ply our hands in circuses and theatres, rather than among crops and vines. Columella loved the soil, and felt that the physical culture of the earth is saner than the literary culture of the town. Farming is a blood relative of wisdom. Consanguinea sapientiae. To lure men back to the fields, he adorned his subject with polished Latin, and when he came to speak of gardens and flowers, he fell into enthusiastic verse. It was in this period that Pliny the Naturalist pronounced a premature epitaph, Latifundia perdidere Italiam, the large farms have ruined Italy. Similar judgments occur in Seneca, Lucan, Petronius, Marshall, and Juvenal. Seneca described cattle ranches wider than kingdoms, cultivated by fettered slaves, some estates were so large, said Columella, that their masters could never ride around them. Pliny mentions an estate with 4,117 slaves, 7,200 oxen, and 257,000 other animals. Land distributions by the Gracchi, Caesar, and Augustus had raised the number of small holdings, but many of these had been abandoned during the wars and bought in by the rich. When imperial administration reduced plunder in the provinces, much patrician wealth went into large farms. The Latifundia spread because greater profits flowed from producing cattle, oil, and wine than from growing cereals and vegetables, and the discovery that ranching, to be most profitable, required the operation of large areas under one management. By the close of the first Christian century, these advantages were being offset by the rising cost of slaves and their slow and uninventive work. The long transition now began from slavery to serfdom. As peace diminished the flow of war captives into bondage, some owners of large estates, instead of operating them with slaves, divided them into small holdings and leased these to free tenants, colony, cultivators, who paid in rent and labor. Most of the agar publicus belonging to the government was now worked in this way. So were the extensive properties of the younger Pliny, who describes his tenants as healthy, sturdy, good-natured, talkative peasants, precisely such as one finds throughout Italy today, unchanged after all changes. The modes and tools of tillage were essentially as they had been for centuries. Plow, spade, hoe, pick, pitchfork, scythe, rake have preserved their forms almost unaltered for three thousand years. Corn was ground in mills turned by water or by beasts. Screw pumps and water wheels raised water out of mines or into irrigation canals. Soils were protected by crop rotation and fertilized by manure, alfalfa, clover, rye, or beans. Seed selection was highly developed. 
Skillful care drew three, sometimes four harvests per year from the rich fields of the Campania and the Valley of the Po. From one planting of alfalfa, four to six crops could be cut yearly for ten years. All but the rarest European vegetables were grown, some of them in greenhouses for the winter trade. Fruit and nut trees of every sort abounded, for Roman generals and merchants and alien merchants and slaves had brought in many new species. The peach from Persia, the apricot from Armenia, the cherry from Pontexeresis, whence its name, the grape from Syria, the damson, or pruna damascena, from Damascus, the plum and filbert from Asia Minor, the walnut from Greece, the olive and fig from Africa. Clever arboriculturists had grafted the walnut upon the arbutus, the plum upon the plane tree, the cherry upon the elm. Pliny enumerates twenty-nine varieties of figs grown in Italy. Through the zeal of our farmers, said Columella, Italy has learned to produce the fruits of almost the whole world. In turn, it transmitted these arts to Western and Northern Europe. Our rich dietary has a wide geography and a long history behind it, and the very food that we eat may be part of our Oriental and classical heritage. Olive orchards were numerous, but vineyards were everywhere, beautifully terraced on the slopes. Italy produced fifty famous kinds of wine, and Rome alone drank twenty-five million gallons per year, two quarts per week for each man, woman, and child, slave or free. Most wines were produced by capitalistic organization, by large-scale operations financed from Rome. Much of the product was exported and taught the graces of wine to beer-drinking countries like Germany and Gaul. During this first century, Spain, Africa, and Gaul began to grow their own grapes. Italian vintners lost one provincial outlet after another and glutted their domestic market in one of the few overproduction crises of Roman economy. The mission tried to ease the situation and restore cereal culture by prohibiting the further plantings of vines in Italy and ordering half of all vineyards in the provinces destroyed. These edicts aroused a fury of protest and could not be enforced. In the second century, the wines of Gaul and the oil of Spain, Africa, and the East began to crowd Italian products out of Mediterranean markets, and the economic decline of Italy began. A large part of the peninsula was given over to grazing. The cheapest soils and slaves could be used for the raising of cattle, sheep, and swine. Careful attention was paid to scientific breeding. Horses were bred chiefly for war, hunting, and sport, seldom as draft animals. Oxen drew the plow and the cart, mules bore burdens on their backs. Cows, sheep, and goats gave three kinds of milk, from which the Italian made delectable cheeses, then as now. Swine were herded in woods rich with acorns and nuts. Rome, said Strabo, lived chiefly on pork fattened in the oak forests of northern Italy. Poultry fertilized the farmyard and helped feed the family, while bees provided the ancient and honorable substitute for sugar. If we add some acres of flax and hemp, a little hunting, and much fishing, we get a picture of the Italian countryside as it was 1900 years ago, and is today. 2. The Artisans There was not in Roman life, and perhaps there would not be in a healthy economy, so geographical a division between agriculture and industry as in our modern states. The ancient rural home, cottage, villa, or estate, was literally a manufactory where the hands of men carried on a dozen vital industries, and the skill of women filled the house and its environs with a score of wholesome arts. There the woods were turned into shelter, fuel, and furniture. Cattle were slain and dressed, grain was milled and baked, oil and wine were pressed, food was prepared and preserved, wool and flax were cleaned and woven. Sometimes clay was fired into vessels, bricks and tiles, and metal was beaten into tools. Life there had an educative fullness and variety that come to few of us in our time of wider movement and narrowing specialties. Nor was this diversity of occupation the sign of a poor and primitive economy. The wealthiest households were the most self-sufficient and prided themselves on making the largest part of what they needed. A family was an organization of economic helpmates engaged in the united agriculture and industry of a home. When an artisan undertook to do a certain task for several families and set up his shop at some center within reach of them all, village economy supplemented but did not supersede domestic industry. So the miller took and ground the grain of many fields. Later he baked the bread, and finally he delivered it. Forty bakeries were unearthed at Pompeii, and at Rome the pastry makers were a separate guild. There were likewise contractors who bought an olive crop on the trees and gathered the fruit. Most estates, however, continued to process their own oil and bake their own bread. The clothing of peasants and philosophers was homespun, but the well-to-do wore garments that, though woven at home, were carded, cleaned, bleached, and cut in a fullery. 
Some delicate woolen fabrics were woven in factories, and such flax as was not made into sails or nets was turned by factories into linen garments for women and handkerchiefs for men. In its next stage, the cloth might be sent to a dyer who not only colored it, but impressed upon it such delicate designs as we find on the costumes in Pompeian murals. Tanning of leather had also reached the factory stage, but shoemakers were usually individual craftsmen, making shoes to order. Some were specialists who made only fancy slippers for feminine feet. The extractive industries were manned almost wholly by slaves or criminals. The gold and silver mines of Dacia, Gaul, and Spain, the lead and tin of Spain and Britain, the copper of Cyprus and Portugal, the sulfur of Sicily, the salt beds of Italy, the iron of Elba, the marble of Luna, Hymettus, and Peros, the porphyry of Egypt, and in general all subsoil natural resources were owned by the state, were operated by it or on lease from it, and provided a main source of the national revenue. The gold of Spain alone yielded Vespasian $44 million a year. The quest for minerals was a chief source of imperialist conquest. The mineral wealth of Britain, says Tacitus, was the prize of victory in Claudius's campaign. Wood and charcoal were the chief fuels. Petroleum was known in Commagene, Babylonia, and Parthia, and the defenders of Samosata threw it in flaming torches upon Lucullus's troops. But there is no sign of its commercial use as a fuel. Coal was found in the Peloponnesus in northern Italy, but was used chiefly by smiths. The art of carburizing iron into steel had now spread from Egypt throughout the empire. Most iron workers, coppersmiths, goldsmiths, and silversmiths had a single forge and worked with one or two apprentices. At Capua, Minterni, Puteoli, Aquilaia, Como, and elsewhere, several forges and smelters were united in factories. Those at Capua were apparently large-scale capitalist enterprises externally financed. The building trades were well organized and specialized. Dendrophoroi, or tree-bearers, cut and delivered the wood. Fabri lignarii, or woodworkers, made houses and furniture. Caimentarii mixed the cement. Structores laid the foundations. Arcuarii built the arches. Pariatarii raised the walls. Tectores applied plaster. Albarii whitewashed it. Artifices plumbarii inserted the plumbing, usually with pipes of lead or plumbum and marmorii paved marble floors. We may imagine the jurisdictional disputes. Bricks and tiles were provided by potteries, many of which had reached the factory stage. Trajan, Hadrian, and Marcus Aurelius owned such factories and made fortunes from them. The kilns of Aretium, Utina, Puteoli, Sorrentum, and Polentia supplied the ordinary tableware of all the European and African provinces as well as Italy. This wholesale production laid no claim to artistic excellence, the emphasis was now frankly on quantity, and the terra sigillata, or signed earthenware that now crowded the Italian market, was distinctly inferior to the earlier product of Aretium. Outstanding work, as we shall see, was done in glass. The factory production of glass, brick, tiles, pottery, and metalware does not warrant us in ascribing an industrial capitalism to ancient Italy. Rome itself had only two large factories, a paper mill and a dyeing establishment. Probably neither metals nor fuels were at hand in quantity, and the profits of politics seemed more honorable than the proceeds of industry. In the factories of central Italy, almost all the workers and some of the managers were slaves. In those of north Italy, there was a greater proportion of freemen. Slaves were still sufficiently available to discourage the development of machinery. Listless slave labor with small stake in the product was not likely to make inventions. Some labor-saving devices were rejected because they might have caused technological unemployment and the purchasing power of the people was too low to stimulate or support mechanized production. There were, of course, many simple machines common to Italy, Egypt, and the Greek world. Screw presses, screw pumps, water wheels, animal-driven grain mills, spinning wheels, looms, the crane and pulley, the revolving mold for pottery. But Italian life was now, in A.D. 96, as highly industrialized as life was ever to be until the 19th century. It would hardly go further on the basis of slavery and a high concentration of wealth. Roman law contracepted large organizations by requiring every sharer in an industrial undertaking to be a legally responsible partner. It forbade limited liability companies and allowed joint stock corporations only for the performance of governmental contracts. Since similar restrictions affected banks, these could seldom provide capital for large-scale enterprise. At no time would the industrial development of Rome or Italy equal that of Alexandria or the Hellenistic East. 3. The Carriers from Caesar to Commodus, wheeled vehicles were forbidden in Rome by day. 
People then walked or were carried in slave-borne chairs or litters. For longer distances, they traveled on horseback or in horse-drawn carriages or chariots. Travel by public stagecoach averaged some 60 miles a day. Caesar once rode by carriage 800 miles in eight days. Messengers bearing the news of Nero's death to Galba in Spain covered 332 miles in 36 hours. Tiberius, hurrying day and night, rode in three days 600 miles to stand beside his dying brother. The public post, by carriage or horse at all hours, averaged 100 miles a day. Augustus had modeled it on the Persian system as indispensable to imperial administration. It was called cursus publicus, as serving the res publica, or commonwealth, by carrying official correspondence. Private individuals could use it only by rare and special permission through a government diploma, double-folded, or passport entitling the bearer to certain privileges and introducing him en route to persons of diplomatic importance. A more rapid means of communication was sometimes arranged by semaphores flashing signals from point to point. By this primitive telegraph, the arrival of the grain ships at Putili was quickly made known to worried Rome. Non-official correspondence went by special courier or merchants or traveling friends. Some traces suggest the existence under the empire of private companies arranging to transmit private mail. Fewer letters were written than now, and better. Nevertheless, the movement of intelligence over Western and Southern Europe was as rapid in Caesar's day as at any time before the railway. In 500 BC, Caesar's letters from Britain reached Cicero at Rome in 29 days. In 1834, Sir Robert Peel, hurrying from Rome to London, required 30 days. Communication and transport were immensely aided by the consular roads. These were the tentacles of Roman law, the members by which the mind of Rome became the will of the realm. They achieved in the ancient world a commercial revolution comparable in kind with that which the railroads effected in the 19th century. Until steam transportation came, the roads of medieval and modern Europe were inferior to those of the empire under the Antonines. Italy alone had then 372 main routes and 12,000 miles of paved thoroughfares. The empire had 51,000 miles of paved highways and a pervasive network of secondary roads. Highways ran over the Alps to Lyon, Bordeaux, Paris, Reims, Rouen, and Boulogne. Others to Vienna, Mainz, Augsburg, Cologne, Utrecht, and Leiden. And from Aquileia, a road skirted the Adriatic to connect with the Via Ignatia to Thessalonica. Magnificent bridges replaced the ferries that had crept across a thousand impeding streams. At every mile on the consular roads, stone markers gave the distance to the next town. Four thousand of these survive. At intervals, seats were placed for tired travelers. At every tenth mile, a statio offered a stopping place where fresh horses could be hired. At every thirty miles was a mancio, an inn that was also a store, a saloon, and a brothel. The main halting points were the civitates, cities, usually equipped with fair hotels, which were in some cases owned and managed by the municipal government. Most innkeepers robbed their guests whenever convenient, and other thieves made the highways unsafe at night despite a garrison of soldiers at each statio. Itineraries could be bought, showing routes, stations, and intermediate distances. Rich men disdaining the inns brought their equipage and slaves with them and slept in their guarded carriages or in the homes of friends or officials on the way. Despite all difficulties, there was probably more traveling in Nero's day than at any time before our birth. Many people, says Seneca, make long voyages to see some remote site, and Plutarch speaks of globe-trotters who spent the best part of their lives in inns and on boats. Educated Romans flocked to Greece and Egypt and Greek Asia, scratched their names on historic monuments, sought healing waters or climates, ambled by art collections in the temples, studied under famous philosophers, readers, or physicians, and doubtless used Pausanias as their Baedeker. These grand tours usually involved a voyage on one or more of the merchant vessels that cut the Mediterranean with a hundred routes of trade. Look at the harbors and seas, exclaimed Juvenal, filled with great keels, more peopled than the land. Rome's rival ports, Putili, Portus, and Ostia, were alive with fabri navales, building ships, stupatores caulking them, subararii, loading sand into them as ballast, sacrarii, unloading grain in sacks, mensores, weighing it, Lenunculariae, operating tenders between large ships and the shore, and urinatores, diving for goods fallen into the sea. Of corn barges alone, twenty-five were drawn up the Tiber every working day. If we add the transport of building stone, metals, oil, wine, and a thousand other articles, we picture a river teeming with commerce and noisy with loading and carrying machines, 
with dockmen, porters, stevedores, traders, brokers, and clerks. Ships were driven with sails, aided by one or more banks of oars. They were larger on the average than before. Athenaeus describes a grain cargo vessel as 420 feet long with a 57-foot beam. But this was highly exceptional. Some vessels had three decks, many took 250, several took a 1,000 tons of freight. Josephus tells of one that carried 600 persons, passengers and crew. Another carried an Egyptian obelisk as large as that in Central Park, New York, together with 200 sailors, 1,300 passengers, 93,000 bushels of wheat, and a load of linen, pepper, paper, and glass. Nevertheless, voyages except along the coasts were still dangerous, as St. Paul found. Between November and March, only a few vessels ventured across the open Mediterranean, and in midsummer, eastward voyages were made almost impossible by the Etesian winds. Night sailing was now frequent, and every harbor of any pretense had a good lighthouse. Danger of piracy had almost disappeared from the Mediterranean. To discourage it and to starve rebellion, Augustus had stationed two main war fleets at Ravenna on the Adriatic and at Mycenaeum on the Bay of Naples, besides minor squadrons at ten other points in the empire. We may judge what Pliny called the immense majesty of the Roman peace by the fact that for two centuries we hardly hear of these fleets. Passenger schedules were largely indefinite, as sailings were determined by weather and commercial convenience. Rates were low, for example, two drachmas, or a dollar twenty, from Athens to Alexandria. But passengers brought their own food, and probably most of them slept on deck. Speed was as moderate as the fares and varied with the winds, averaging six knots per hour. One might cross the Adriatic in a day, or like Cicero, take three weeks, from Patri to Brundisium. A swift cruiser might make 230 knots in 24 hours. With favorable winds, six days carried one from Sicily to Alexandria, or from Gades to Ostia, and four from Utica to Rome. The longest and most dangerous voyage was the six-month sail from Aden in Arabia to India, for monsoons forced vessels to hug the pirate-breeding coast all the way. At some time before A.D. 50, an Alexandrian Greek skipper, Hippolus, charted the periodicity of the monsoon winds and found that in certain seasons he could sail directly and safely across the Indian Ocean. The discovery was almost as important for that sea as the voyage of Columbus was for the Atlantic. From Egyptian ports on the Red Sea, ships thereafter sailed to India in forty days. About A.D. 80, another Alexandrian captain of unknown name wrote a Periplus of the Erythrean Sea as a handbook for merchants trading along the East African coast and with India. Meanwhile, other mariners had developed routes through the Atlantic to Gaul, Britain, Germany, even to Scandinavia and Russia. Never before in human memory had the seas borne so many vessels, products, and men. 4. The Engineers The ships and roads that carried goods, the bridges that bound the roads, the harbors and docks that received the ships, the aqueducts that brought clean water to Rome, the sewers that drained the rural marshes and the city's waste, were the work of Roman, Greek, and Syrian engineers operating with armies of free labor, legionaries, and slaves. They raised or drew heavy loads or stones by pulleys on cranes or vertical beams, worked by windlasses on treadmills turned by animals or men. They banked the treacherous Tiber with walls set back in three stages so that low water would not expose the muddy bed. They dredged a multiple harbor at Ostia for Claudius, Nero, and Trajan, opened lesser havens at Marseille, Puteoli, Mycenaeum, Carthage, Brundisium, and Ravenna, and renewed the greatest of all at Alexandria. They emptied the Fusine Lake and reclaimed its bed for cultivation by boring a tunnel through a mountain of rock. They lined the subsoil of Rome with sewers of concrete, brick, and tile which lasted for hundreds of years. They drained the swamps of Campania sufficiently to make it habitable, for many sumptuous palaces are indicated by the ruins there. They executed the astonishing public works by which Caesar and the emperors mitigated unemployment and beautified Rome. The consular roads were among their simpler achievements. How did these highways compare with those of today? They were from 16 to 24 feet wide, but near Rome part of this width was taken up with sidewalks, or margines, paved with rectangular stone slabs. They went straight to their goal in brave sacrifice of initial economy to permanent saving. They overleaped countless streams with costly bridges, crossed marshes with long, arched viaducts of brick and stone, climbed up and down steep hills with no use of cut and fill, and crept along mountainsides or high embankments secured by powerful retaining walls. Their pavement varied with locally available material, usually the bottom layer, or pavimentum, 
was a four to six inch bed of sand or one inch of mortar. Upon this were imposed four strata of masonry, the statumen, a foot deep consisting of stones bound with cement or clay, the rudents, ten inches of rammed concrete, the nucleus, twelve to eighteen inches of successively laid and rolled layers of concrete, and the summa crusta of silex or lava polygonal slabs, one to three feet in diameter and eight to twelve inches thick. The upper surface of the slabs was smoothed, and the joints were so well fitted as to be hardly discernible. Occasionally the surface was of concrete. On less important roads it might be of gravel. In Britain it was composed of flint stones laid in cement upon a gravel bed. The substructure was so deep that little attention was given to drainage. All in all, these were the most durable roads in history. Many of them are still in use, but their steep gradients designed for pack mules and small vehicles have compelled their abandonment by modern traffic. The bridges that carried these roads were themselves high exemplars of wedded science and art. The Romans inherited from Ptolemaic Egypt the principles of hydraulic engineering. They employed them on an unprecedented scale, and the methods they transmitted remained unchanged till our time. They carried to its ancient limit the building of foundations and piers under water. They drove into the bed a double cylinder of piles, boarded each cylinder tight, drained the water from between them, covered the exposed bottom with rock or lime, and on this basis raised the pier. Eight bridges crossed the Tiber at Rome, some sacredly ancient like the Pons Sublicius, on which no metal might be used, some so well built that like the Pons Fabricius, they are functioning to this day. From these spans, the Roman arch would go forth to bridge a hundred thousand streams in the white man's world. Pliny thought that the aqueducts were Rome's greatest achievement. If one will note the abundance of water skillfully brought into the city for many public and private uses, if he will observe the lofty aqueducts required to maintain a proper elevation and grade, the mountains that had to be pierced, the depressions that had to be filled, he will conclude that the whole globe offers nothing more marvelous. From distant springs, fourteen aqueducts, totaling thirteen hundred miles, brought through tunnels and over majestic arches into Rome some three hundred million gallons of water daily, as large a quantity per capita as in any modern city. These structures had their faults. Leaks developed in the lead pipes and required frequent repair. By the end of the Western Empire, all the aqueducts had gone out of use. But when we consider that they fed ample water to homes, tenements, palaces, fountains, gardens, parks, and public baths, where thousands bathed at once, and that enough remained to create artificial lakes for naval battles, we begin to see that despite terror and corruption, Rome was the best managed capital of antiquity and one of the best equipped cities of all time. At the head of the water department at the close of the first century was Sextus Julius Frontinus, whose books have made him the most famous of Roman engineers. He had already served as a praetor, as governor of Britain, and several terms as consul. Like modern British statesmen, he found time to write books as well as to govern states. He published a work on military science, of which the concluding portion, Stratagemata, remains, and left us his personal account of the water system of Rome, De Aquis Urbis Romae. He describes the corruption and malfeasance that he found in his department on taking office, and how palaces and brothels secretly tapped the water mains, and so greedily that once Rome ran out of water. He describes his resolute reforms, tells us in proud detail the sources, length, and function of each aqueduct, and concludes like Pliny, Who will venture to compare with these mighty conduits the idle pyramids, or the famous but useless works of the Greeks? We sense here the frankly utilitarian Roman with little taste for beauty apart from use. We can understand him and admit that a city should have clean water before it has Parthenons. Through these artless books we perceive that even in the age of the despots there were Romans of the old type, men of ability and integrity, conscientious administrators who made the empire prosper under the lords of misrule and opened a way for monarchy's golden age. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.